Part One of Tacitus's Germania. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Germania by Publius Cornelius Tacitus. Translated by Alfred John Church and William Jackson Brodrib. Part One. Germany is separated from the Galli, the Rishi, and Pannonii by the rivers Rhine and Danube. Mountain ranges, or the fear which each feels for the other, divided from the Samatai and Desi. Elsewhere, ocean girds it, embracing broad peninsulas and islands of unexplored extent, where certain tribes and kingdoms are newly known to us, revealed by war. The Rhine springs from a precipitous and inaccessible height of the Russian Alps, bends slightly westward, and mingles with the northern ocean. The Danube pours down from the gradual and gently rising slope of Mount Abnoba, and visits many nations, to force its way at last through six channels into the Pontus. A seventh mouth is lost in marshes. The Germans themselves... I should regard as aboriginal, and not mixed at all with other races through immigration or intercourse. For, in former times, it was not by land, but on shipboard that those who sought to emigrate would arrive, and the boundless, and, so to speak, hostile ocean beyond us, is seldom entered by a sail from our world. And beside the perils of rough and unknown seas, who would leave Asia, or Africa, or Italy, for Germany, with its wild country, its inclement skies, its sullen manners and aspect, unless, indeed, it were his home. In their ancient songs, their only way of remembering or recording the past, they celebrate an earth-born god, Tusco, and his son Manus, as the origin of their race, as their founders. To Manus they assign three sons, from whose names they say the coast tribes are called Ingavones, those of the interior Herminones, or the rest Istivones. Some, with the freedom of conjecture permitted by antiquity, assert that the god had several descendants, and the nation's several appellations, as Marci, Gambrivi, Suevi, Vandili, and that these are genuine old names. The name Germany, on the other hand, they say, is modern and newly introduced, from the fact that the tribes which first crossed the Rhine and drove out the Gauls, and are now called Tungrians, were then called Germans. Thus, what was the name of a tribe, and not of a race, gradually prevailed, till all called themselves by this self-invented name of Germans, which the conquerors had first employed to inspire terror. They say that Hercules, too, once visited them, and when going into battle they sing of him first of all heroes. They have also those songs of theirs, by the recital of which Baratus, they call it, they rouse their courage, while from the note they augur the result of the approaching conflict. For, as their line shouts, they inspire or feel alarm. It is not so much an articulate sound as a general cry of valour. They aim chiefly at a harsh note, at a confused roar, putting their shields to their mouth, so that, by reverberation, it may swell into a fuller and deeper sound. Ulysses, too, is believed by some, in his long legendary wanderings, to have found his way into this ocean, and, having visited German soil, to have founded and named the town of Askebergium, which stands on the bank of the Rhine, and is to this day inhabited. They even say, that an altar dedicated to Ulysses, 
with the addition of the name of his father Laertes, was formerly discovered on this same spot, and that certain monuments and tombs, with Greek inscriptions, still exist on the borders of Germany and Raetia. These statements I have no intention of sustaining by proofs, or of refuting. Every one may believe or disbelieve them as he feels inclined. For my own part, I agree with those who think that the tribes of Germany are free from all taint of intermarriages with foreign nations, and that they appear as a distinct, unmixed race, like none but themselves. Hence, too, the same physical peculiarities throughout so vast a population. All have fierce blue eyes, red hair, huge frames, fit only for a sudden exertion. They are less able to bear laborious work. Heat and thirst they cannot in the least endure. To cold and hunger, their climate and their soil inure them. Their country, though somewhat various in appearance, yet generally either bristles with forests or reeks with swamps. It is more rainy on the side of Gaul, bleaker on that of Noricum and Pannonia. It is productive of grain, but unfavourable to fruit-bearing trees. It is rich in flocks and herds, but these are for the most part undersized, and even the cattle have not their usual beauty or noble head. It is number that is chiefly valued. They are, in fact, the most highly prized, indeed the only, riches of the people. Silver and gold the gods have refused to them. Whether in kindness or in anger, I cannot say. I would not, however, affirm that no vein of German soil produces gold or silver. For who has ever made a search? They care but little to possess or use them. You may see among them vessels of silver, which have been presented to their envoys and chieftains, held as cheap as those of clay. The border population, however, value gold and silver for their commercial utility, and are familiar with, and show preference for, some of our coins. The tribes of the interior use the simpler and more ancient practice of the barter of commodities. They like the old and well-known money, coins milled or showing a two-horse chariot. They likewise prefer silver to gold, not from any special liking, but because a large number of silver pieces is more convenient for use among dealers in cheap and common articles. Even iron is not plentiful with them, as we infer from the character of their weapons. But few use swords or long lances. They carry a spear, Thromia is their name for it, with a narrow and short head, but so sharp and easy to wield that the same weapon serves, according to circumstances, for close or distant conflict. As for the horse soldier, he is satisfied with a shield and spear. The foot soldiers also scatter showers of missiles, each man having several and hurling them to an immense distance, and being naked or lightly clad with a little cloak. There is no display about their equipment. Their shields alone are marked with very choice colours. A few only have corslets, and just one or two here and there a metal or leathern helmet. Their horses are remarkable neither for beauty nor for fleetness, nor are they taught various evolutions after our fashion, but are driven straight forward 
or so as to make one wheel to the right in such a compact body that none is left behind another. On the whole, one would say that the chief strength is in their infantry, which fights along with the cavalry, admirably adapted to the action of the latter, is the swiftness of certain foot soldiers, who are picked from the entire youth of their country, and stationed in front of the line. Their number is fixed, a hundred from each canton, and from this they take their name among their countrymen, so that what was originally a mere number has now become a title of distinction. Their line of battle is drawn up in a wedge-like formation. To give ground, provided you return to the attack, is considered prudence rather than cowardice. The bodies of their slain they carry off even in indecisive engagements. To abandon your shield is the basest of crimes. Nor may a man thus disgraced be present at the sacred rites, or enter their council. Many indeed, after escaping from battle, have ended their infamy with a halter. They choose their kings by birth, their generals for merit. These kings have not unlimited or arbitrary power, and the generals do more by example than by authority. If they are energetic, if they are conspicuous, if they fight in the front, they lead because they are admired. But to reprimand, to imprison, even to flog, is permitted to the priests alone, and that, not as a punishment, or at the general's bidding, but, as it were, by the mandate of the god whom they believe to inspire the warrior. They also carry with them into battle certain figures and images taken from their sacred groves, and what most stimulates their courage is, that their squadrons or battalions, instead of being formed by chance or by a fortuitous gathering, are composed of families and clans. Close by them, too, are those dearest to them, so that they hear the shrieks of women, the cries of infants. They are to every man the most sacred witnesses of his bravery. They are his most generous applauders. The soldier brings his wounds to mother and wife, who shrink not from counting or even demanding them, and who administer both food and encouragement to the combatants. Tradition says that armies already wavering and giving way have been rallied by women, who, with earnest entreaties and bosoms laid bare, have vividly represented the horrors of captivity which the Germans fear with such extreme dread on behalf of their women, that the strongest tie by which a state can be bound is the being required to give, among the number of hostages, maidens of noble birth. They even believe that the sex has a certain sanctity and prescience, and they do not despise their counsels or make light of their answers. In Vespasian's days, we saw Veleda, long regarded by many as a divinity. In former times, too, they venerated Orinia and many other women, but not with servile flatteries or with sham deification. Mercury is the deity whom they chiefly worship and on certain days they deem it right to sacrifice to him, even with human victims. Hercules and Mars they appease with more lawful offerings. Some of the Suevi also sacrifice to Isis. Of the occasion and origin of this foreign rite, I have discovered nothing, but that the image, which is fashioned like a light galley, indicates an imported worship. The Germans, however, 
do not consider it consistent with the grandeur of celestial beings, to confine the gods within walls, or to liken them to the form of any human countenance. They consecrate woods and groves, and they apply the names of deities to the abstraction which they see only in spiritual worship. Augury and divination by lot no people practice more diligently. The use of the lots is simple. A little bough is lopped off a fruit-bearing tree and cut into small pieces. These are distinguished by certain marks, and thrown carelessly and at random over a white garment. In public questions, the priest of the particular state, in private, the father of the family, invokes the gods, and, with his eyes towards heaven, takes up each piece three times, and finds in them a meaning according to the mark previously impressed on them. If they prove unfavourable, there is no further consultation that day about the matter. If they sanction it, the confirmation of augury is still required, for they are also familiar with the practice of consulting the notes and the flight of birds. It is peculiar to this people to seek omens and monitions from horses kept at the public expense, in these same woods and groves, are white horses, pure from the taint of earthly labour. These are yoked to a sacred car, and accompanied by the priest and the king, or chief of the tribe, who note their neighings and snortings. No species of augury is more trusted, not only by the people and by the nobility, but also by the priests, who regard themselves as the ministers of the gods, and the horses as acquainted with their will. They have also another method of observing auspices, by which they seek to learn the result of an important war. Having taken, by whatever means, a prisoner from the tribe with whom they are at war, they pit him against a picked man of their own tribe, each competent using the weapons of their country. The victory of the one or the other is accepted as an indication of the issue. About minor matters, the chiefs deliberate. About the more important, the whole tribe. Yet even when the final decision rests with the people, the affair is always thoroughly discussed by the chiefs. They assemble, except in the case of a sudden emergency, on certain fixed days, either at new or at full moon. For this they consider the most auspicious season for the transaction of business. Instead of reckoning by days as we do, they reckon by nights, and in this manner fix both their ordinary and their legal appointments. Night they regard as bringing on day. Their freedom has this disadvantage, that they do not meet simultaneously, or as they are bidden, but two or three days are wasted in the delays of assembling. When the multitude think proper, they sit down armed. Silence is proclaimed by the priests, who have on these occasions the right of keeping order. Then the king or the chief, according to age, birth, distinction in war, or eloquence, is heard, more because he has influence to persuade than because he has power to command. If his sentiments displease them, they reject them with murmurs. If they are satisfied, they brandish their spears. The most complimentary form of assent is to express approbation with their weapons. In their councils, an accusation may be preferred, or a capital crime prosecuted. Penalties are distinguished according to the offence. 
traitors and deserters are hanged on trees. The coward, the unwarlike, the man stained with abominable vices, is plunged into the mar of the morass, with a hurdle put over him. This distinction in punishment means that crime, they think, ought in being punished to be exposed, while infamy ought to be buried out of sight. Lighter offences, too, have penalties proportioned to them. He who is convicted is fined in a certain number of horses or of cattle. Half of the fine is paid to the king or to the state, half to the person whose wrongs are avenged and to his relatives. In these same councils they also elect the chief magistrates, who administer law in the cantons and the towns. Each of these has a hundred associates chosen from the people, who support him with their advice and influence. They transact no public or private business without being armed. It is not, however, usual for any one to wear arms till the state has recognised his power to use them. Then, in the presence of the council, one of the chiefs, or the young man's father, or some kinsman, equips him with a shield and a spear. These arms are what the toga is with us, the first honour with which youth is invested. Up to this time, he is regarded as a member of a household, afterwards as a member of the commonwealth. Very noble birth, or great services rendered by the father, secure for lads the rank of a chief. Such lads attach themselves to men of mature strength and of long-approved valour. It is no shame to be seen among a chief's followers. Even in his escort there are gradations of rank, dependent on the choice of the man to whom they are attached. These followers vie keenly with each other as to who shall rank first with his chief, the chiefs as to who shall have the most numerous and the bravest followers. It is an honour, as well as a source of strength, to be thus always surrounded by a large body of picked youths. It is an ornament in peace, and a defence in war. And not only in his own tribe, but also in the neighbouring states, it is the renown and glory of a chief to be distinguished for the number and valour of his followers. For such a man is courted by embassies, is honoured with presence, and the very prestige of his name often settles a war. When they go into battle, it is a disgrace for the chief to be surpassed in valour, a disgrace for his followers not to equal the valour of the chief. And it is an infamy, and a reproach for life to have survived the chief and returned from the field. To defend, to protect him, to ascribe one's own brave deeds to his renown, is the height of loyalty. The chief fights for victory. His vassals fight for their chief. If their native state sinks into the sloth of prolonged peace and repose, many of its noble youths voluntarily seek those tribes which are waging some war, both because inaction is odious to their race, and because they win renown more readily in the midst of peril, and cannot maintain a numerous following except by violence and war. Indeed, men look to the liberality of their chief for their war-horse and their blood-stained and victorious lance. Feasts and entertainments, which, though inelegant, are plentifully furnished, are their only pay. The means of this bounty come from war and rapine nor are they as easily persuaded to plough the earth and to wait for the year's produce as to challenge an enemy and earn the honour of wounds. Nay, they actually think it tame and stupid to acquire by the sweat of toil what they might win by their blood. 
whenever they are not fighting, they pass much of their time in the chase, and still more in idleness, giving themselves up to sleep and to feasting, the bravest and the most warlike, doing nothing, and surrendering the management of the household, of the home, and of the land, to the women, the old men, and all the weakest members of the family. They themselves lie buried in sloth, a strange combination in their nature that the same men should be so fond of idleness, so averse to peace. It is the custom of the states to bestow by voluntary and individual contribution on the chiefs a present of cattle or of grain, which, while accepted as a compliment, supplies their wants. They are particularly delighted by gifts from neighbouring tribes, which are sent not only by individuals, but also by the state, such as choice steeds, heavy armour, trappings, and neck chains. We have now taught them to accept money also. It is well known that the nations of Germany have no cities, and that they do not even tolerate closely contiguous dwellings. They live scattered and apart, just as a spring, a meadow, or a wood has attracted them. Their villages they do not arrange in our fashion, where the buildings connected and joined together, but every person surrounds his dwelling with an open space, either as a precaution against the disasters of fire, or because they do not know how to build. No use is made by them of stone or tile. They employ timber for all purposes, rude masses without ornament or attractiveness. Some parts of their buildings they stain more carefully with a clay so clear and bright that it resembles painting or a coloured design. They are wont also to dig out subterranean caves, and pile on them great heaps of dung, as a shelter from winter, and as a receptacle for the year's produce. For by such places they mitigate the rigour of the cold, and should an enemy approach, he lays waste the open country, while what is hidden and buried is either not known to exist, or else escapes him from the very fact that it has to be searched for. End of Part 1 Recording by Andrew Coleman